I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on the first Almanac North show of 2023. Duluth Mayor Emily Larson is here tonight to talk about her decision to run for a third term and her outlook for the city in the new year. Local economic experts join us in the studio with their thoughts on the economy in 2023. And we'll remember our friend and colleague Joel Mann who was laid to rest this week in Hoyt Lakes. Those stories and voices of the region coming up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. And Denny, we're back after a few weeks off for the holiday season, ready for the new year. And I trust you had a nice Christmas and a nice New Year's. I did indeed. And, and your family? We did too. All right. Good to be back to work. Good to be back. You well, bet. let's begin with the headlines. All right. Thank you, Julie. And Happy New Year to everyone. Well, the Minnesota DNR is warning people to stay off the ice at the Canisteel Mine Pit near Beauvais. The legacy mine pit on the Iron Range is being pumped to keep water from overflowing creating unsafe ice conditions. Pumping is a temporary solution to prevent damage to Beauvais infrastructure. The DNR is working with state and local government to find a permanent solution, which will require legislative funding. The St. Louis County Board selected Duluth Commissioner Patrick Boyle as chair of the board this week. Boyle succeeds Commissioner Paul McDonald of Ely. Commissioner Keith Nelson of Virginia was selected as vice chair of the board for 2023. The new year also means new legislative sessions in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Both states swore in newly elected lawmakers this week, and they gaveled the legislatures into session. Governors Tim Walls in Minnesota and Tony Evers in Wisconsin were also sworn in this week to begin their second terms in office. And Duluth's Glensheen Mansion will host a free community day this Sunday from 9 to 5. It's a way of saying thank you to the community for supporting the historic attraction. Everyone who arrives by 5 p.m. will get a free classic tour and can also explore the outdoor Spirit of Lights display. Duluth Mayor Emily Larson announced last month that she will be running for a third term in office. The mayor was first elected in the fall of 2015 and then re-elected in late 2019 for her second four-year term. She is the first to announce for the city's top job, but other candidates are expected. Joining us now to talk about her decision and to stand for re-election is Emily Larson, mayor Hello. of the city of Duluth. Hey. Well, Mayor, welcome. Hey. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy, Happy to New be Year. here. Thanks for having me. I guess the big question is, why do you want to run for mayor for a third time? Oh, I'm so excited about the direction of our community, the hard work we've done, the road uh, reconstruction plan we have in place, the $36 million we are investing in housing, our progress on climate, our expansion of jobs, uh, three years in a row of, of sky-high permits. Uh, really excited about all of that and then actually accelerating and moving forward with this inclusive vision of expanding our economy growing jobs and continuing to do the good work that we're doing mm -hmm. well you answered all of our questions so <laughs> great to have you here that's a wrap <laughs> good like it let's talk about safety first of all great uh, there was a joint press conference this week with the duluth police that's chief right. uh, mike sanoya what are the key takeaways from that end of the end of the year safety report yeah thank you uh it, it's really a a pleasure to work with Chief Sanoa. He's, he's wonderful, uh, seems very well liked by the department. Community is really enjoying his leadership as well. Uh, we talked about, uh, well, I wanted to give him a chance to actually kind of uh, share with the community where things are at. So he's, he's been there about a quarter, um, about three months. And so this is what we talked about. Violent crimes are down. Uh, there, there has been an increase in some shootings, many of which mm -hmm. is attributed to suicide and self-inflicted. Uh, proactive patrolling is way up. Uh, calls for response are down. We are also experiencing workforce shortages. Uh, but what we wanted to talk about is just the how the statistics of crime and what we're seeing for public safety are very, very good and wanting to measure that against and uh, measure how people are feeling and talk about the perception of crime. The department is down like 22 offices. Yeah. Why do you think there's such a shortage? Oh, this is true of departments all over the country. I think the, what we've seen the last few years, uh, policing and public safety is an incredibly difficult job. It always has been, but in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder and public sentiment shifting in some areas of the country, 
you know, it's a much more stressful job. And so we are like many departments down. Uh, what we're seeing, we just hired, I think, eight new uh, officers. We have 12 more in the queue. We're currently down, I think it's 22 officers, but we have a plan to catch up. And I'm really appreciating Chief Sanoa's emphasis on retention and uh, workplace satisfaction as well. Mm -hmm. Last time you were here, which was a couple of months ago, we talked about the downtown task force oh, yeah. and the recommendations. Yeah. Um, maybe you can just kind of bring us up to date on how things are going as, as you start to implement those. Yeah, that's right. And that really dovetails well with both the vision of moving forward as mayor and, you know, addressing concerns through the pandemic and public safety. So convened a task force of 14 different community leaders. Uh, came up with 27 recommendations. We actually have 15 of them already underway. We just met today, uh, some of us internally, to look at what we're doing. We are addressing safety, activation, vision, and investment in our downtown. <clears throat> our downtown, like many across the country, have been impacted by the pandemic, by people's uh, working from home, changing how offices feel. We're now seeing many cities doing what we just did last year, which is to actually convene a strategy around how to ensure that um, downtowns continue to be vibrant. We're gonna be commissioning a brand new downtown housing study. We're increasing public safety elements. We're increasing lighting, addressing blight, addressing graffiti. It's, it's a really exciting work plan, and I'm very happy for this community that we have it. You've outlined four area of, uh, areas of priorities for the city. At the top of the list is economic development. Yeah. What do you want to see done yet? Well, so first of all, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing with an economic development audit of the, of the city that we are conducting right now to make sure that our policies, our practices are very forward thinking. We're working with our economic development partners in the community to do that. Uh, we are prioritizing good jobs and living wage jobs when we are investing public funds into private projects. Um, and we're also looking to grow the, the projects that are already here, it, ensuring um, that Cirrus has a research and development center that was once an empty MRO facility that DITA would incur $800,000 of, of cost per year is now a $15 million innovation center. Mm -hmm. We're also really proud of saving the paper plant uh, and the jobs that were involved there at ST Paper. So lots of things that we're building on and growing on to continue to make sure that we remain very competitive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While we have you here, it has been a record snow year, lots of residents. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Lots of residents struggling to keep I up know. with clearing the sidewalks. It's hard. What's the solution for the city? Why, it, why aren't sidewalks handled the same way roads are with the city's <laughs> just doing it you all? You know, we don't know, I will be really honest huh? about this. We don't know any other city that actually addresses sidewalks in this, you know, um, addresses full clearing of sidewalks. They're, it just is not done. Cities cannot handle or financially handle that. Mm -hmm. What we're asking residents to do is make a best effort. And I have a sidewalk. I have the same experiences. I really do understand the frustration. This is a lot of snow. And we've got a lot of people out moving it around. We're asking residents to make their best effort mm -hmm. to clear snow. We know that's not always easy. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a long winter, so we're going to need each other's help. And, and will Mayor there be enforcement um, fines, anything like that? Uh, yeah, we're, there is a mechanism mechanism for enforcement. It's it's a, at least a two to three week lag time because of mail time and notification and wanting to give you a chance to clear your sidewalk. So it's not as if something goes into place immediately. And Mayor, with that, we have to say thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much. You thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. It's time now for Voices of the Region when we hear from an area journalist about the stories they're covering. Our guest this week is Danielle Kading from Wisconsin Public Radio. After more than four years now, a federal agency has found a superior refinery's lack of safeguards during a shutdown for maintenance led to the 2018 explosion that caused um, thousands of residents in Superior to evacuate and also injured three dozen workers. Uh, the U.S. Chemical Safety Board just came out with their final report in the very last week of December. So now the U.S. Chemical Safety Board is recommending 16 safety recommendations that could be addressed by not just the refinery, but also Synovus Energy, the new owner, 
and also um, federal labor regulators and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, in particular, they're suggesting that the EPA could create a program that prioritizes and emphasizes inspections of these types of units, these fluid catalytic cracking units that operate using hydrofluoric acid or hydrogen fluoride. And if you recall, it was the presence of that chemical and its use at the refinery that prompted the evacuation over fears that that tank holding that chemical could be compromised because when it's released in high amounts, it could cause severe burns or lung damage um, in, in high levels. And so um, that tank never did spill. All the safety measures in place worked, but they're saying that refineries nationwide should be examined uh, if they're using this type of equipment um, because of the threat and the risk that it poses to the community. An interesting thing that the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources is undertaking is this uh, bear, black bear litter and diet survey. And they just started that last year in 2022. Um, and now they're continuing this work. And as part of that, they're asking the public for help identifying bear dens throughout Wisconsin. And, you know, in particular, black bears are found more heavily, I think, in northwestern Wisconsin. So what they are doing is they're collecting this data that would be used to assess the reproductive rates of female black bears, known as sows. And that would help improve their modeling that they use for these populations, which decides the hunting quotas or how much how how many bears can be harvested um, during a bear hunt that is held each year. And typically, you know, around four thousand bears are harvested across the state each year. And so they're going to go out sometime this winter um, and start uh, examining these bear dens that they found. And that involves someone known as a den diver who has to crawl into a bear den and administer an immobilization drug um, to these hibernating black bears so that you know they're uh, a little bit more calm to deal with when they're collecting this data. Wild rice is considered vital to Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota Ojibwe tribes who say that they were guided by prophecies to find their home where food grows on water. Um, and these tribes journeyed from the northeastern U.S. until they found uh, wild rice or what they call minomen in the western Great Lakes region. And tribes like the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior uh, made their home near Madeline Island on Lake Superior. Um, and if you recall too, the Bad River Tribe has a large expanse of wild rice beds, um, one that's considered the largest wild rice bed on the Great Lake. There's been some research going on to determine what's happening with wild rice. There have been pressures on um, that plant related to climate change and water levels as we've seen flooding in recent years and um, also warmer temperatures over the decades and it, it, the wild rice acreage across northern Wisconsin has been cut in half according to the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission and as a result of all this research and work going on, now there is a research collaborative that's been formed uh, between researchers at the University of Minnesota and uh, Ojibwe tribes in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan um, to, to better understand and protect wild rice by prioritizing indigenous knowledge and views while they're conducting those studies. With 2022 now in the rearview mirror, this is a good time to call in a couple of our local longtime economic observers for an update. 
2022 was a rough year for the economy with inflation at near record levels and high prices. As 2023 begins, are there signs of improvement ahead? We'll ask Tony Barrett, economics professor emeritus from the College of St. Scholastica, and Ron Brochu is editor and publisher at Business North. Gentlemen, welcome back. Good to have you here again. H Happy a New, new year. year, a new month. Ron and Tony, if you could both maybe give us a, a few seconds as to what you see coming up for 2023 in the economy. Well, I'm an optimist. I don't necessarily see a recession. I think most economists are calling for a recession, Fed raising interest rates, economic slowdown. I think it's possible we'll dodge it. And if we do have a recession, it'll be mild. That'll be good for the iron range with steel demand and uh, for the regional economy. So I'm kind of an optimist. <laughs> Ron? <laughs> I'm going to go the other direction. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are just a lot of predictions that uh, the inflation will resume at, at as bad or a higher rate and uh, that there will be a recession. And I think there's some international factors that uh, could really create havoc, you know, especially if. Uh, the U.S. dollar doesn't remain the reserve currency, and that that might take a while to play out. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, you know, if the dollar loses its strength, I think we have major problems. For years, uh, we've talked about uh, challenges with with the workforce here in our area, and a lot of times that challenge was there weren't enough jobs. Has that flipped around now, <laughs> where there are too many jobs and not enough people to fill them at this point? Uh, yes. This is something I was talking about even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Businesses were saying they couldn't find qualified workers. Now they were saying they can't find a worker whether they're qualified or not. We have a problem in this country and it's not going away. We're not having children like we used to. We're not allowing immigration like we used to. I, I read somewhere that the immigration controls that started about 10 years ago during the Obama administration has reduced our workforce by 2.3 million workers. Well, if we don't want immigration and we're not want having a bunch of children, either the existing workers get paid a lot more and hopefully they'll be a lot more productive. Mm -hmm. But it's a long run problem. It's not just 2023. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Ron, talk to us about consumer confidence. Well, the, there is an issue I think with big ticket items and uh, that's probably gonna show up first in real estate and uh, automobiles and uh, you know appliances uh, it, it it may depend on you know what happens the next few months in terms of uh, inflation more than anything mm -hmm. that's the uh, wild card mm -hmm. How, how's inflation impacting this region right now well until recently everyone's been talking about wage increases mm -hmm. but the wage increases have been less than inflation so our purchasing power has been eroded away. I was just seeing something today where if you're in the middle tier of income, you've had the biggest impact. It's been like a 16% increase in your cost of living over the last two years. Uh, and, that, and that reduces consumption. And that's, that's the concern. That's why you want to see inflation drawn down. The Fed's trying to do it, but the way they try and do it is what's being euphemistically called demand destruction, <laughs> you know, a recession. Yeah. Now, so uh, th that's that's the concern. Hopefully, there's enough built-in savings that we can keep spending money. Uh, construction, government spending will keep the recession from occurring, or, or if it occurs, it's short and mild. Mm -hmm. Are housing starts up or down? Uh, they're down. <laughs> housing is the first sign, the canary in the coal mine of a recession. Housing you starts. raise interest mm -hmm. rates, mortgage rates go up, Housing has crushed, and they had a, a miserable year. Now, whether that bounces back as mortgage rates, it's actually declined a little bit recently. Uh, and that's something that you know I'll talk about, I hear, and the mayor talked about. Mm -hmm. And it's critical for Duluth in this region, not just Duluth, mm -hmm. to get more housing. Mm -hmm. Ron, uh, the mining industry, where do you see the, the bright spots and the maybe challenges right now? Well, the, in some sectors of you know, the steel industry, uh, there's still strength. In others, there's not. You know, automobile manufacturing is down, and that's affected a lot by inflation, too, and interest rates. 
But, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in mining on the range. There are some new developments. Uh, Masabi Metallics made an announcement this yeah. week. And, uh, uh, the, you know, there's, I, I, you know, the, it's posed to do well if the other parts of the economy do well. But, you know, it's greatly impacted by things like construction, you know, with uh, piping and beams. And I need a short I, answer. Uh, uh, did the pandemic? Nope. Before, nope. You, before you do that, we've got 30 seconds, and I've got to get some predictions in. Oh, go right <laughs> so, ahead. First of you. <laughs> I, I think it's going to be a tough year basically because of the uncertainty. I, uh, business owners don't know which way to jump. Uh, consumers don't know which way to jump. And I, I think it's just going to be a very difficult, uncertain sort of year. Mm -hmm. I'm more optimistic regionally. I think the steel industry will hold up. But I also think we've benefited for the last two years with the construction on the interstate and the hospital construction. And now with so much more emphasis on housing and in multifamily housing in particular, I see that as just a nice little offset. We can spend a little less as consumers, but we'll get the investment. All right, well, Dennis, I'm sorry for interrupting you on that one, <laughs> but we have to hold these uh, folks' uh, feet to the fire you're, next year and see how they did on their prediction you're, when you're we bring them clock. back. You're All on the right. clock, you're on the clock. Thank you both. Ron Roshu, <laughs> Tony Barrett, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, we're almost out of time, but it's easy to keep up with the show by following us on Facebook and Twitter. The WDSC website is the place for program updates and station news, and download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs on demand. And we leave you this week on a bittersweet note as we say goodbye to our friend and colleague, Joe Mann. Joe was laid to rest yesterday in his hometown of Hoyt Lakes after his unexpected death at the age of 49. Our shock and sadness of Joe's passing is still fresh, and we honor him this week with a video tribute in his memory. Things just won't be the same here without you, Joe. Joe Mann was a constant here at WDSC WRPT. For more than 25 years, Joe was part of nearly every live production and membership drive here at the studio and many other programs as well. Whether it was floor directing Almanac North or Doctors on Call or running cameras for great gardening, Joe was an incredibly reliable and enthusiastic member of our team. He treated everyone as if they were longtime friends and he enjoyed chatting with guests and hosts of our shows. Viewers and members may not have seen him on screen, but his steady, reliable presence behind the camera were vital to these programs. I bet I still have handwritten notes by Joe. And it was usually a tip on what was happening at Fairlawn Mansion, what's going on with the armory, what's happening at Carpola's Manuscript Museum, or what's happening at the Douglas County Historical Society. He was a man about town. He was the type of person that could sit down at the newspaper real machine in the library and print off articles that he would find that would supplement the exhibits. He was so kind to the guests, they absolutely loved him. He always had a story to tell about anything and just loved the questions. He would be sorely missed. There's always going to be a piece of Joe Man here in Carpels. Joe always had kind of an idea or an anecdote or a thought about everything we were working on. Um, and then, you know, just a few weeks ago, I realized I don't know that much about superior history. And of course, Joe was the person who happened to be there. And we sat for a couple of hours and just talked about all the funniest superior historical stories he could, he could remember. And um, he, I think, you know, after a while I came to realize the reason Joe knows so much about so many things and, and the reason he kind of knows everyone is because he's such a, a curious person and he's so kind and generous and he just asks people to, to tell him stories. And that's one of the things I'll remember about Joe. Besides working in the industry, he had a nearly encyclopedic knowledge of Twin Ports broadcasting history. <laughs> you couldn't come to this show without hearing Joe giggle. A lot of people remember that he worked so hard, and he did. He was incredibly passionate about what he did in many of the different jobs that he had in the Twin Ports. But to be truly honest, his legacy is, for me is going to be that giggle and that care and that mentorship that he did not just give to me, but to all of the fellow floor crew members here on Almanac North. And 
to all of the folks here at WDCWRPT. Joe's big giggle and the slap of the leg he would do, or that overly confident, proud grin on his face when he knew information about the television market or the area's history I and others had no idea about yet, he loved that. Joe was inducted into the Upper Midwest Emmy Silver Circle Class of 2020, an honor that recognized him for his 25 plus years in the television industry. Joe was very proud of that recognition and he loved being part of the WDSE crew. Hello everyone, I'm coming to you from the studio of WDSE WRPT Television here in Duluth. I wish we could be together tonight, but due to the COVID pandemic, that's not possible. So tonight, I hope you stay safe and stay healthy and I continue to wear my mask and gloves here at the station. I'm also honored to receive the Silver Circle and thank you to those who nominated me, the Board of Governors who voted, and to my co-workers past and present, and to those broadcast industry friends who I learned from and allowed for me to be a part of their team. A friend of mine had an expression that he used when we parted from each other. He would say, see you all of a sudden, and when I think of that expression, I often think of Joe Mann, uh, because so many times Joe would suddenly appear next to me. And for as randomly as he seemed to appear, he always had an intention. He had information to share, and he shared it enthusiastically. He shared it with admiration and pride. And it wasn't about bringing attention to himself, but about bringing attention to whatever the subject was. He was intentional, he was enthusiastic, and he was joyful. Joe left us on December 21st, the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, but he will always remain a bright light in our memories and in the history of the station. Rest easy, Joe. We won't forget you. <laughs>